Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. I've heard it said that even a blind pig finds an acorn now and then. And I think maybe that might be a good metaphor for the case I'm going to talk about today, which uh, comes out of the federal district court in New Mexico. It's not complete yet, but I stumbled onto it when I was doing some research on a First Amendment auditor who claimed that there was a lot of corruption in the Seventh Judicial Circuit. I know a lot of you are going to be absolutely shocked to learn this, but the First Amendment auditor didn't accurately recite the facts in terms of uh, what his problem with the court in uh, New Mexico was. So I'm going to play just a snippet here of what he said in his video, and then we're going to go through the docket piece by piece and see what's happened. The auditor is actually represented by counsel who seem to be reasonably competent, and the judges are represented by people who missed a huge defense, and it had to be up to the uh, district court, the, the essentially the federal district court judge alerted them to this defense and said, hey, do you want to assert this? And they're like, shucks, yeah, I think we will. Anyway, let's take a look at the original video that I'm sort of responding to here. Um, I'm going live because I'm super excited. Uh, He's so excited he can't hold the darn thing I, straight. Um, I've been talking to people all day about how I would approach uh, telling the public and telling the audience about what's going on with my uh, civil lawsuit. I have a 1983 civil lawsuit filed in federal court against the District 7 court in the state of New Mexico. I not really. He has that on file, but it's going nowhere, and we'll find out why here in a little bit. And Judge Mercedes Murphy, Judge um, Murdoch, I uh, can't remember her first name, and uh, two court clerks, and student, including Susan Rosenthal and uh, Jason Jones. It's Rosengall, by the way, not Rosenthal. And you really can't sue clerks for what they've done if they're simply following a judicial order. They don't have any discretion in that. So they have to follow judicial orders. They are absolutely incredible. People have told me in the past, you can't sue a judge. That's right. You just can't do it. You um, can't. These judges have stepped so far out of line, so no, insanely haven't. far out of line, that not only was I able to find one attorney, that would sue the judges for me, but two. Um, and Hence, a blind pig always finding an acorn somewhere. And I can't even I can't even tell you how incredible they've been. They've been incredible enough to have not to have botched service uh, on this. So I mean, there is there is that. It's not usual to see a lawyer botch service. But we we <clears throat> filed the lawsuit. I, I think it's about two months ago now and got absolutely no response. Well, when you don't perfect service, you don't get a response. So this video will go on for a little bit here, and you really never get to the heart of the case. So without you know, going too much further, let me tell you what the, the heart of the case is here. The heart of the case is that he was banned from the courthouse and he asserts that it's because of viewpoint discrimination that he that they are trying to shut down his reporting on corruption. And the reality is that he's being banned from the courthouse because of his behavior. So let's take a look at the complaint and maybe analyze that just a little bit. So first of all, he says that Thomas Paine stated that tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. All of these things are probably improper in a complaint because it's supposed to be a short and plain statement of the facts entitling you to relief. But a lot of lawyers, lawyers do this because they use their complaint as a essentially a public relations tool. And it goes through the parties and the jurisdiction. It talks about who these people are. Plaintiff is an independent investigative journalist in pretty much the same way that Chile de Castro is a constitutional law scholar. And it says that he's been involved in exposing public corruption. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he says. 
So he was in engaging in investigative journalism in the courthouse, and as a result of that, on or about March 1, two officers with the New Mexico State Police delivered an administrative order, which he's attached as Exhibit 1. The purpose of the order was to tell him that he's banned from entering the, the courthouse unless he's appearing for a hearing or has specific court business. That's what he says is outrageous and above, the, you know, above and beyond that it's viewpoint discrimination, yada, yada, yada. In addition to seeking a violation of the freedom of the press and discrimination, USC Section 1983, he also asks for relief under substantive due process. And then he goes to procedural due process, a violation of the New Mexico Constitution, and a request for relief that includes, among other things, declaratory judgments and a temporary restraining order. Well, a temporary restraining order is usually obtained without um, a hearing, and it's basically on the basis of pleadings, and you have to show that you're entitled to it. And as a result, it's probably not going to go. And a preliminary and permanent injunction. Well, if you ask for a TRO, it can be converted into a pre preliminary injunction later on. But what he's really asking for here is a preliminary injunction, and the lawyers just didn't quite get that right, probably because they haven't done this before. And then before he actually gets to the point where he signs this complaint, the request is for a temporary restraining order to pre prevent irreversible harm it's not irreversible harm, it's irreparable harm. That's where we're at. He does get the standards for issuance of a preliminary injunction. He will be irreparably injured by denial of relief. Well, that's completely speculative. We'll see more about that here in a minute. So he purports to have this served on the 7th Judicial District, on the judges and on the clerks, and then the case, they don't answer because service was not performed appropriately. At any rate, the, a default was issued. Now, there's a difference between a notice of default and a default judgment. A default occurs when you exceed past the 20 days that you have to answer without asking for additional time or making some other motion before the court to extend the time to file an answer, which these parties, who are judges, who would know this, don't do. So there has to be some explanation besides the mere fact that they have not been properly served. And I suspect it probably comes down to somebody dropped the ball somewhere. Again, the lawyers who are representing the judges here may not be at the top of their game. I don't know. It's, for that matter, the lawyers representing the plaintiff here may not be at the top of their game because generally speaking, you file a complaint and then in support of your complaint, you file a separate memorandum of law to advocate on behalf of your preliminary injunction or temporary restraining order. In this case, they combined those two into one pleading, which I have never seen done before in federal court. And I suspect that most judges would consider this to be improper inside the complaint for relief. But for whatever reason, they included it there, and we'll see when this complaint is answered, that the judges return the favor. Now, what's the difference between the entry of a default and a default judgment? The entry of the default simply means that the time has passed and that without leave of court, the party who is in default can't file pleadings, can't file a substantive pleading. They can file a motion to essentially vacate the default, but they can't file substantive pleadings without leave of court. A default judgment, on the other hand, has to be supported by evidence. In other words, you have to come in, you have to present affidavits, you have to present something to support your right to relief, and you do that by filing a motion for default judgment and attaching your evidence to that, or setting a hearing on the issue to be uh, done before the judge so that you can introduce the evidence that supports your default judgment. Now, generally, when I answer a complaint in uh, federal court, I file an actual answer, and I start with the allegations that are made against my client, and I say either I admit them or I deny them or I do not have enough, uh, enough information to admit or deny, and as a result, I deny the same. All of those get put in in numbered paragraphs that correspond to the numbered paragraphs from the petition 
or the complaint. And then at the end, I put in my, my affirmative defenses. For some reason, they have filed a response to the complaint that does not deny the actual allegations of the complaint. And if the plaintiff's lawyers had been pretty smart at this point, they would have moved immediately for a default judgment because they're answering out of time. And in addition to that, they're not actually answering. So here's what we have. It, it says it's the response to the complaint. The really important information is, is included in this document, and the judge will wind up relying on it later on. Springer seeks an injunction, and, and essentially they're going to say he argues from a faulty premise. He does not meet the legal requirements for an injunction. The restrictions on access to the court are content neutral and re reasonable in light of the dis disruption his refusal to follow court rules has caused to official court business. Now, the reason that's important is because this order was initially entered as a result of actions taken during COVID. And let's, let's read along with uh, the court here uh, for what happened. On or about January 23rd, 20, or 27th, 2023, plaintiff entered a courtroom in the 7th Judicial Circuit to observe a hearing before our hearing officer, Gordon Bennett. The hearing officer says, what's your name? He said, I didn't give it. I'm sorry. And then he made some inaudible response and says, I'm just trying to spectate a public hearing, nothing more, nothing less. I can appreciate that you're here to spectate, and I can appreciate that this is a public hearing, but you're not going to violate the rules. Which rules are those? Put a mask on. Oh, you want me to put a mask on? Tell you what, if you threaten me with arrest, I'll just leave. Right out of the First Amendment auditor playbook. I'm not threatening anything. I'm just telling you, if you don't abide by the rules of my courtroom, you will leave. If you choose not to leave of your own accord, you will be escorted. Would I be arrested or charged with anything? It's almost like he wants to be. Well, of course he does want to be, because when you have an auditor channel, the only way you ever get additional likes and a bunch of like 500,000 people following your feed is by virtually being arrested routinely and causing a ruckus somewhere. I suppose it makes interesting viewing for certain people who are prone to view everything as a conspiracy. But for the most part, for most normal people, we look at this and go, eh, nothing to see here. Well, if you continue this, I may charge you with contempt. Okay, so there's a threat. Uh, and if arrest, then if I don't do what you say you're doing right now. Would you happen to have your phone out right now recording this? I mean, is if there's a threat of arrest, I'll just leave. Notice how he didn't answer the question. Are you recording this conversation? The court is. There's a camera there. You're right. The court is by statute and rule. I am allowed. I'm required to record. Well, by statute. Tell you what, son. I'll just get a bigger team and we'll come back, sweetheart. All right? We'll be back. Well, first of all, that's very disrespectful to the hearing officer. He's not a judge. He's a hearing officer. But you really shouldn't do that in a courtroom. And then uh, see also James Freeman caught in a bald face lie by a camera in his own courtroom, dishonorable Gordon Bennett. So he made a YouTube video on this. They attached that as Exhibit B. Court staff were harassed and threatened after this incident. It, it gets worse. But the idea that the judges were acting just out of bounds by enforcing their own court rules and their own court orders, which ordered them to wear masks, that is ridiculous that they were out of bounds in doing that. It's facially ridiculous. And there is no First Amendment violation here because it's not has nothing to do with his content, even though they cited to the content, and it has everything to do with his disruptive behavior in the courtroom. And so that's why they're doing this. That's why the court issued this order banning him from the courtroom. So let me see if I can cut through a lot of this real quickly here. And here is the timeline of events in this case. The complaint is filed, then they've the judges file a motion to vacate the default. Then they file this response, which is not an answer. The court denies the TRO because they don't believe that the plaintiff has sustained his burden to show that he will be irreparably harmed or that he will succeed on the merits. That's based in large part on the response that showed the disrespect to the court. Then the uh, judges file a motion to dismiss the complaint and before that can be ruled, the plaintiff files an amended complaint. And under the federal rules, after a motion to dismiss is filed, 
you have to get leave to file an amended complaint. As, as a result of that, the motion to dismiss that the judges filed was denied as moot. The judges, not to be outdone, file a motion to dismiss the amended complaint in quash service. The court grants the motion to dismiss with leave to refile because the federal law requires that if you move to quash service, you have to give them leave to replead. So thereupon, they file a second amended complaint, and as a result of that, the judge issues a show cause order. And let's take a look at the show cause order. Before we get to the order to show cause, I want to show you some language in the amended order denying the preliminary injunction that illustrates in large measure why he had absolutely no chance of success on the merits here. And then we'll get to the other reason that he had absolutely no chance of success on the merits, which is contained in the show cause order. But here is the part of the restraining order or the order on the restraining order, temporary injunction, that really seals the deal. And this is because federal judges, just like state court judges, have a duty to control their courtroom. Federal judges, just like state court judges, have a duty to enforce the court rules. And when you knowingly violate the court rules, or when you treat court personnel disrespectfully, then in, in either the federal court or the state court, the claim that you have about viewpoint discrimination goes right out the window. And this is the amended order denying plaintiff's request for a temporary restraining order slash preliminary injunction. She's basically reviewed the record and says, look, I, I don't need argument on this. I'm going to deny the motion. One of the things that they ordered him to do was if he had court business to conduct, he had to go to the sheriff's office and get an escort to escort him into the courthouse and stay with him during any business that he conducted. So the clerk says, where's your escort? Excuse me, where's your escort? What do you mean? You're only supposed to be here on official business with an escort. I said, where is your escort? Because per the court order, you are required to be escorted by law enforcement. An escort? Yes, sir. Now, this is where it gets ridiculous. I'm pretty sure prostitution is illegal in New Mexico. I don't know if you're trying to solicit me right now. I don't know if you're trying to solicit me, but I don't appreciate it. Matter of fact, I think I'll head to the sheriff's department right now and let them know you're trying to solicit me. Is that what you're trying to do? No. Are you trying to be my escort? I said, where is your escort? Because per court order, you are required to be escorted by law enforcement. So you're trying to be my escort? No, sir. How long have you been in the escort business? That may make for funny banter and great repartee for something like a, at a cocktail party or if you're putting on a skit. But if you're in a courtroom and you're treating somebody like that, you obviously miss the importance of what goes on in courtrooms. So on May 1st of this year, the court issues an order to show cause. And she goes through the background. So the second amended complaint is, is a, asserted against individual defendants in their individual capacities only. And then she goes into the discussion and she says, defendant's motion does not assert judicial immunity, quasi-judicial immunity, or 11th Amendment immunity as bases for dismissal. However, the court raises these issues sua sponte because it appears that defendants may be immune. And then she cites Hennessy versus University of Kansas Hospital Authority, a 2022 case out of the Tenth Circuit, observing that a district court may raise 11th Amendment sovereign immunity sua sponte. And then she goes, even if the individual ones are not immune, it appears count one, count two, and count three fail to state a claim under section 1983. And of course, the, the, the fourth count, which is based on the New Mexico Constitution, is a state law claim, and it would not be appropriate to raise in federal court because it puts the state up against the federal government. Again, an 11th Amendment problem. Absolute judicial immunity and quasi-judicial immunity, she discusses that. She goes through all of that, and she says, look, you guys may have missed this, so here's what I'm ordering you to do. You have 21 days from this order to show cause to show why the plaintiff why the claims asserted in the Second Amendment complaint should not be dismissed for failure to state a claim or, or lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And defendants have 14 days from the day the plaintiff files this response to, to this order, which to file a reply. Now, oddly enough, it goes almost exactly the opposite of that. The plaintiffs filed their response and the defense files their response, but the defense response is essentially 
parroting a lot of what the judge put in this order. So again, my, my point in all of this was that it seemed to me that maybe the lawyers who are representing these nice judges in New Mexico have not been paying attention to the degree that they should have been paying attention to all of the different defenses that were available to sitting judges in courts of law and equity in the state of New Mexico. It just always shocks me, I guess it shouldn't, that people leave out the important parts. When he's talking about how badly he was treated by the court, he didn't mention that he essentially called the clerk an escort, meaning a prostitute, which is really beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned. You clearly should not do that, and anybody with, who is being reasonable would not have interpreted where's your escort, especially when there is an order banning you except if you don't have an escort, they wouldn't have interpreted that as an offer of prostitution. And so what he has done is effectively cut the legs out from underneath any federal claim that he may or may not have. And I personally don't think, I mean, if I was the judge, it would have already been gone. Uh, I guess it's a good thing for him that I'm not the judge. And it's a good thing for me that I'm not the judge because that's not a um, job I think I really want. I, I've seen what you have to do to be a judge, and I'm not sure that I could do it. You know, I think about Judge Doro in that Daryl Brooks trial, and she had patience to go, and you know, she went a long way with that guy, and I admire her for having that patience, I'll tell you. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. If you have the opportunity today, go out of your way, do something kind for someone. Again, if you have comments, leave them in the comments down below, email me, you know the drill, and catch me down here at the beach again next time, and we'll talk about something else interesting. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.